Okay, um, so can you now see the, the screen? Yes, Doctor. Yes? Yes. Is it clear, the slide? Yes, Doctor. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here is the attendance, the QR. Uh, it's not the Unimus QR code. Uh, it's a Google form, so you have to fill in the form uh, because uh, later, I will transfer the information in uh, in the Google uh, in the QR system, the Unima system. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Okay. So today's agenda. Uh, okay, so I have talked about the course briefing, and then uh, we're going to have a look at an introduction to bioprocess technology. And then uh, we're going to have a look at the first LU uh, of this course, which, which is introduction to fermentation. Okay, all right. Um, is the slide clear? Big enough for you to, to see? Yes, right. So bioprocess technology. So this that's the name of this course, right? Um, it's not just merely a, a course. Yeah? It's actually a field, a field in uh, biotechnology. It's one of the niche areas in biotechnology. So when I say niche areas, biotech is a, is a huge field. It means that it has many branches. You have plant biotechnology, there is animal biotechnology, there is microbiology, there is industrial biotech, genetic engineering, okay? And bioprocess technology is one of them. It's one of uh, those niche areas, yeah, niche areas. So uh, why you guys have to study bioprocess technology? Because that will complete your understanding in biotech. Without bioprocess technology, is not complete. It's not going to be complete. Okay. The reason why I say that, if you could see this slide, um, when we talk about uh, any discovery, like even like the vaccine, any discovery of microorganism that can produce, let's say, ethanol, right? anything, uh, it will start with the lab scale. You're going to have, you're going to start everything at the lab scale first. Right. Uh, it means that when it is says that at the lab scale, it is in small scale. It's not going to be at industrial scale yet. So if let's say you have found an an organism that can produce um, ethanol, for example, you will start from the lab scale. Okay. So how it goes, how it progress, how actually how eventually it will reach the industry or the factory scale, you have to bridge the gap. Yeah? So let Let's say here, it, this is the lab scale. This is the lab um, uh, lab stage. And then how you want to transfer it to the industrial scale. When we say the industrial scale, is it means it's, it's large scale, eh? factory scale. So we need the information. We need the understanding in bioprocess technology. So that's why you have to learn it. That's why it is very important in biotech to understand the principles of bioprocess technology. So can you imagine without bioprocess technology, without this field, you cannot actually uh, transfer whatever that you have produced in the lab, regardless 
how red it is, you cannot transfer it to the factory scale. And what happened? When you cannot produce it in large scale, you cannot actually reach the people because at the end, we want our, our invention, our discovery to benefit the people, right? The, the community, like when you discover certain drugs, at the end, you want it to be marketed. You want it to be to to be benefited by people like vaccine nowadays, vaccine COVID-19, for example, that's the easiest example. It has undergo all the processes in bioprocess technology, actually. OK, so that's how it can reach us now. That's why it can be produced in large scale. So that's the importance of bioprocess technology. And it covers everything because biotech, there are so many products of biotech. Vaccine is one of them. We have enzymes, we have a biofuel, we have lots of drugs or pharmaceuticals. Vaccine, what I mean in vaccine, we have many types of vaccine, antibodies. Uh, there's so many yeah? food even. We have we have so many uh fermented food that have that has been produced in, in the factory, like um bread even bread, cheese, uh, what else? So many, yeah? So without this bioprocess, we cannot get, uh, we cannot bridge the gap, sorry. We cannot bridge the gap. Okay, that's why you have to, to learn this course and understand uh, what are the principles of it. Because uh, we, when we are talking about uh, translating the scale uh, from small scale to big scale, it's not just about, um, you know, like it's not just about increasing it increasing the volume merely like when you prepare a drink uh, a coffee drink in a mug right and then you just put small amount of water but if you want to prepare the drinks in a jug or maybe in a large container you just increase the volume of water and you just increase uh, the syrup or the amount of the whatever the coffee or tea right uh, it's not it's not as simple as that why because um, in biotech, we are dealing with biological organism, yeah, biological organism. So when uh, the microbes in the large, in the small scale, the behavior will be different with that in larger scale. So the environment uh, do influence the behavior of the microbes. So that's why we have to understand the correct principles, how we want to increase the scale, how we want to uh, carry out in larger scale, for example. Yeah? So that's the importance of bioprocess technology. Okay, so basically bioprocess technology is about um, producing the bioproducts, and it's not just about producing, but also uh, separating and purifying the products. Because whenever the products is produced, uh, it's not just about the target product. There are some byproducts. Byproducts means those products that are also produced by the biological organism. But we do not want those byproducts because let's say if you are if you want to produce uh, bioethanol, bioethanol is the main product. But along with the bioethanol during the production, there are also side products produced by the, uh, for example, the yeast that produce the bioethanol. But we want we want only the bio we want only the bioethanol, right? So that byproducts should be separated, should be removed. So that's why after the production stage in bioprocess, there is another stage called downstream processing, which is um, which is concerned with the separation and purification. Okay. So let's have a look at some facts over here. So as I said just now, bioprocess is the backbone of biotech field. Without bioprocess technology there will be no product. So whatever in the lab will be a waste, yeah? So having said that, the field is responsible for translating discoveries of life sciences into practical and industrial products, processes, and techniques that can serve the needs of society. Yeah, I mentioned about it. Yeah? So that's how the things can reach the people at the end. And then uh, the two main stages of bioprocess technology, um, there are two main stages, upstream processing, we call it, and downstream processing. Okay, so upstream processing is the production stage. Production means um, the production of the byproducts. Now we are talking about uh, bioproducts eh, because we are in biotech. Uh, 
uh, and the production refers to the process of cultivating the organisms to produce the byproducts, bioproducts. And then after the upstream processing, after the production stage, it doesn't just end there. You cannot get the products yet. You have to separate and you have to purify uh, the byproducts from all the uh, site products. Yeah? And finally, the product is processed into uh, the final form. And that's only when it can be uh, channeled to the uh, to the to the market, to to the people, to the community. Okay, so those are the two main stages of bioprocess, upstream and downstream processing. Um, and then bioprocess is thus an important niche of biotech as it translates the research and development in the laboratory to the industry. Yeah? The easiest way for you to uh, to remember is uh, the bridge just now when I when I show you this picture just now. This is us. This is now the, the area or the niche, the bioprocess is the is the bridge, okay, between the lab and the industry. Okay, so I hope that you are clear with the background uh, of this course, um, why you have to learn about it, and um, bioprocess is my my specialty, my uh, background, biopsychology. So if you have chosen FYP topics, some of you have chosen uh, topics under bioprocess group, uh, which is under me, uh, Dr. Daya, and also some of the topics offered by Prof. Awang and also Dr. Miki. Okay, so we are in bioprocess. So those who are taking like plant biotech, uh, maybe you are working, you'll be working with Dr. Ho, Animal Biotech, Dr. Chum. So now uh, under FYP, you can see that the niche areas. Okay, we are you are you are you start to focus on your niche areas. Yeah. Uh, so so those who are doing bioprocess, you'll be dealing with fermentation uh, in your FYP. Okay. So now uh, let's move to the first LU of this course. Uh, the first LU is introduction to fermentation processes. Um, so just now I mentioned that bioprocess is divided into upstream and downstream, and upstream is concerned with the production stage, isn't it? So in in biotech, uh, we we don't yeah it is still bio production stage, but we, now we are going into specific terms. So the production stage. In biotech, normally uh, one of them is fermentation. Fermentation is a name of a process. Okay, um, so so that is the the thing or the topic that we're going to focus today. Uh, so what is fermentation, and then how to carry out the fermentation, um, the types of fermentation process, fermentation modes that will be covered in under part one, and then uh, under part two we are going to have a look at uh, some information on cell growth, measurement of the microbial growth, and also kinetics, okay? So let's have a look at uh, definition of fermentation. Fermentation um, is the production stage. Remember that the fermentation is a production stage, but it's more specific. Uh, that's um, a terminology in biotech, yeah? So, by definition, it is any process involving the production of organic products by the mass culture of microorganisms. Uh, or some of the, some of the definition also uh, cover animal cell culture. Like uh, yeah, but anyway, it's just to be on the safe side. It's organism, like organism. It means that. Uh, it's not necessarily microorganism, but in this course, we are going to focus more on microbes. Okay, so basically fermentation um, is a process of producing, producing bioproducts. Why we call it bioproduct? Because uh, the producer are organism, biological organism. Okay, um, so let's have a look at some of the terms here. Culture. So what does culture mean? Culture in uh, biotech means um, it's it's a is a is a solution that contains media and also organisms. Okay, culture. Um, okay, so that's the definition of fermentation. 
Uh, if you have a look at some of the definitions here, this is actually the definition uh, that has been given by scientists throughout the time. Fermentation is not a new process. Eh? We, we, don't did, we, uh, we don't just discover fermentation 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It's even like 100 years ago. We already have the fermentation. But it's only that during that time, uh, biotech field might not have been uh, invent. I mean, the field has not been introduced yet. But the science of fermentation is already there. It already exists yeah, during our ancestors. How we know that is through the discovery or the invention of fermented food. For example, the alcohol, the beer, right? And then uh, tempeh. Uh, that's example of fermented food. Um, kimchi, yeah, Korean in, in South Korea, I mean, in Korea, they have already kimchi like 400, 400 years already. Tempeh is, is, uh, is a popular food in Indonesia and they have it already like 100 years ago. Uh, uh, what else? In Malaysia, uh, we have pickles, pickles, you know, pickles, acha. Uh, so pickles is, is also an example of fermented food because it's like the process of doing it or making it is all about um, what we call in Malay, we call it perap, right? We, uh, yeah, acha, acha is it? Um, it means that during the process, the microbes will actually secrete the thing. So it gives the taste to the food, okay? Right, so in, in short to say that fermentation is not a new process. It's, it's not a new process, it is an old process. But what makes the process different? Yeah, like those in 100 years ago with today's fermentation. Can anyone say or give an idea why? What is the difference between those fermentation, today's fermentation and fermentation 50 years ago, 100 years ago? Okay, what comes to your mind? What is the difference between our life and our ancestors' life. Are you with me? Technology. Yeah, yeah, production. Right? Yes, I love that word. Technology, yes, that's a very good answer. The technology, what it means by technology is how we do that. Our understanding is much better because we know the existence of microorganisms. Um, our ancestors, they just have maybe like a very you know, basic, they don't, maybe they know that about the creatures, but they don't really know about the microbes specifically. So us, like us, we understand the microbes, okay, like we know more because of the discoveries throughout the time, right? During that hundred years, more scientists have discovered this and discovered uh, that and so and so. Okay? So that helps us to understand the process better and to carry out the, uh, the process better. So it means that the process of making, for example, bread, bread is also a fermented food. The process of making bread today is way better and way advanced than uh, it is when it is like 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so because of the technology, the platform that we are using is much more advanced. Yeah? Like our essences, they are just using maybe like um, vessel, like maybe additional vessel, like tempayan, to to produce certain uh, food, yeah? so certain uh, fermented food. Yeah? But uh, like now, factories they have vessel, yeah? control vessel, maybe like reactor that can control the temperature, pH, uh, the conditions inside, yeah? so that the microbes can produce better products. Yeah. Okay. So that is the biggest difference: the technology. Um, so when we talk about fermentation, okay, remember fermentation is a process of growing the microbes. So there are a few important things that you should take note because those things influence the process. So what, uh, what it means by influence the process, it will influence the product at the end. Okay, so what are those aspects? Of course, the first one is microorganism. It will not be called a fermentation process if it is without microbes. Yeah, so if we talk about production, production is a very broad term. Uh, in 
in the industry, in the factory, there are so many types of production, but some of the production are not fermentation because they don't involve microorganisms. Okay, let's say chemical reaction without microbes is not a fermentation. It's just maybe just a, a normal production process. Okay, so microorganisms is one of the important uh, components of the fermentation process. So the second uh, component, important component is food or in uh, science or in biotech, you normally say media or medium. Medium is singular, media is plural, right? Okay, so when uh, I'm sure that you have uh, experience in during the micro, micro practical, right? You have, you provide the media to the micro. So why you provide the media? Because the media is actually food to the microbes, but we don't say we don't say um, we don't say food lah in the lab because we want to be more um, sounds more sciencey. So we say media, okay? Uh, we don't say uh, what else. Uh, so we we use scientific terms, okay? Media is one of the scientific terms that we use, but it's is actually the purpose is it serves as food, okay? Uh, so why food? Because microorganisms need the food, right? Same like like us. We are organisms. We are living organisms. We need rice. We need bread. We need water. We need protein. So those are food to us. Without food, we cannot survive. We cannot do our work, right? The same thing goes to microorganisms. They they need such things to live, and also to produce the product that we want from them. So that's why it's very important to provide food or media, okay? And in terms of uh, when we're talking about media, um, they are in, there are many important things that we have to uh, take note. So microorganisms, they have their own favorite food. Okay, some of let's say E. coli, they cannot eat. Uh, maybe they cannot eat methanol, but methanol is a food to certain microorganisms like pica pasteuris or yeast. Uh, so every microorganism it has its own favorite food. You can say I, I try to make it easy for you to understand. If I if I say optimal media, then it's something sounds a bit technical. So but uh, to say that yeah, every microorganism it needs, it has its own optimal media or favorite food. Yeah. So if you don't provide, let's say uh, certain food, uh, maybe they can they can grow, but they're not happy. They're not as happy as if they are provided with their favorite food. Okay, I hope that makes sense and that could help you to understand better. Uh, and some of the food, uh, they are inhibitory. It means that uh, if you provide certain food, uh, it will it might kill the microorganisms. So you might want to avoid such uh, formulation. Okay, when we talk about media in the lab, uh, we need to know how to formulate. How to formulate means that the media is not just involved of one component. It will involve carbon source, nitrogen source, trace elements. Same like us, we need rice. Rice is our carbohydrate, isn't it? Then we need protein like fish, uh, meat, chicken. That is our protein. So the same thing goes to microbes, uh, the organism. Uh, they need carbon. Carbon source, it means like glucose glycerol, uh, sucrose, like sugar, it's like sugar. And then nitrogen sauce, uh, like yeast extract, uh, ammonium chloride, ammonium, ammonium sulfate, okay? And then trace elements, maybe not so much, maybe in certain uh, amount, but they need certain, certain, that kind of certain elements, okay? So there are so many things actually to talk about media, uh, formulation, inhibitory uh, media, what kind of media that is suitable for certain microbes. So how to know such things? We have to read a lot because scientists throughout the time, they have discovered the information and they have reported those information in the articles, journal articles. So that's why for your FYP, you need to refer to journal articles. Why journal articles? Why not just a normal website? Because those journal articles, the information are more reliable. It's, it has undergo research process, research, um, yeah, research process. So, and it has been verified by the people in that field. Uh, so that's why articles are more reliable than if any 
than any information on the website, uh, whatever. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the platform, eh, the, back to here, uh, the third components of a fermentation process, the platform, conditions. So um, what is meant by platform is uh, for fermentation, uh, there are many types of platforms that we can use. We can even conduct a fermentation in shake flask. This is shake flask, LMA flask. Uh, if you put the microbes into it and then you put some media into it, you grow it at certain condition, maybe at temperature that the microbes can survive, the fermentation can take place. Okay, but shake class is not the only platform. Um, it's, it's the traditional platform. So uh, in the modern days of fermentation, we have uh, advanced platform. Uh, we call it bioreactor or fermenter. Bioreactor or fermenter are the same. Sometimes people call bioreactor, sometimes people call fermenter. So, but it refers to the same uh, equipment. It's a place uh, where fermentation can be carried out uh, and we can have the control system. So, what's the difference between fermenter and the shake flask? The fermenter or bioreactor, it has the control system. So, what is meant by the control system? Uh, the temperatures, the temperature control system, the pH control system, uh, the oxygen control system. Yeah? So, what's the purpose of those control system? It's actually to uh, to give better environment for the microbes to grow. Okay? Uh, so you have to know also that microbes, certain microbes, every microbe actually, every microorganism, they have their own uh, suitable or optimal temperature, pH, oxygen level. Okay? Some of the microbes grow at 37 degrees. Some of the microbes grow at uh, 60 degrees. So those grow at 37, cannot grow at 60. Yeah, maybe they are they will be killed. So by using fermenter with those control system, we can set the temperature at 37 so that throughout the fermentation process, the temperature can be maintained. Uh, it will not be changed. So that's how we can make sure that the microbes can grow well and at the end it can produce the product of interest. So the purpose of fermentation, uh, the fourth one here, um, of course, the, this is the ultimate aim, the product. Why we carry out fermentation process? Because we want to get the product at the end. Uh, why we grow the microbes? Because we know the microbes, certain microbes, it can produce certain product. Yeah. For example, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it can grow, it can, sorry, it can produce ethanol. So we grow the Saccharomyces cerevisiae in order at the end to get the bioethanol. So, because we want to harvest it, we want to market it, we want to sell it. Okay, that is that is how uh, why we carry out fermentation process. And uh, every microbes it has its own uh, specialty to produce uh, product of interest. Okay, like just now I said, Saccharomyces can produce Saccharomyces can produce ethanol. There are also some other yeast that can also produce uh, ethanol. <clears throat> And then um, maybe, for example, like uh, tempeh, you know tempeh uh, is a fermented food. Yeah? So uh, tempeh is produced by Rhizopus oligosporus. So that is the name of the yeast that can produce tempeh. So you can see that every uh, product, it has its own specific organisms that can produce. But uh, sometimes they are, sometimes like, for example, ethanol, it's not just limited to Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Some of the other microbes, some of other yeast can also produce ethanol. Yeah, right. And there are, uh, there are also microbes, microorganisms. Uh, when we talk about microorganisms, they are divided into uh, native or wild type. Okay, what is meant by native or wild type? Those that, that you can get it naturally from the environment. Like if you take soil, uh, if you screen for the microbes uh, and you got the microbes, right, that is an example of wild type microbes. But uh, there is also another type which is genetically modified microorganism. You have learned about uh, recombinant DNA technology, right? So certain microbes, um, they are produced through genetic, I mean, they are not just produced, they are just modified. Uh, let's say the wild type, um, uh, I mean, you, you take from a certain gene and you insert into uh, certain microbes, let's say E. coli, 
Yeah, and you that the gene that you insert is uh, because you want that microbes to produce, let's say, a certain product like cellulase in large amount. So you insert the cellulase producing gene into that organism, and at the end, that organism is a recombinant. We call it recombinant microorganism, right? Or a genetically modified microorganism. So those uh, recombinant microorganisms are also used in fermentation process, and even that is actually the difference between the uh, all fermentation and modern fermentation. Modern fermentation, we use a lot of genetically modified organisms. Like our essences, they just use whatever the microbes from the natural environment. They don't do anything. They don't do any modification because of their limited knowledge, right? 100 years ago, maybe the understanding in uh, genetic engineering might not be there yet. But now we know about it. So that's why people modified the organism. Okay. So those are the four important components of a fermentation process. Microorganism, medium, food, yeah, platforms and conditions. What I mean by condition just now is like temperature, pH, oxygen, uh, shaking and all this stuff. Uh, and then the product. Yeah? So those are the four important components of fermentation process. Okay, so here we can see that there are actually many types of fermentation products. So a lot of them are food, yeah, because those are uh, examples of uh, products that have been produced a long time ago. And then um, there are also new products. New, new is uh, like maybe 50 years ago, yeah, or maybe 20 years ago that have been just produced in modern fermentation era. Yeah? Bioethanol, an example of it. We have enzymes. Uh, lots of enzymes produced from fermentation. Um, yeah, there are so many actually. There are so many products. This is about what. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So that's uh, some basics of fermentation. Okay. Whenever we talk about fermentation, again, it's a process, and it can be divided into two uh, types. Two types of fermentation. One is liquid state or submerged fermentation. So as the name implies, it is in liquid form. It is like something in suspension. And the second type is solid state fermentation. Solid state fermentation, something that is in solid form uh, basically. Okay, not to say that it doesn't have liquid, but the liquid is a very in a is only in a very small amount and is not flowing. Okay. Uh, submerged fermentation, you can see that this is an example of the bioreactor. You can see the liquid inside it. That is the culture. Uh, so it's liquid state. Uh, solid state fermentation, uh, the easiest example for you to relate is tempeh. Tempeh is an example of solid state uh, fermentation. Uh, the product of solid state fermentation. Um, kimchi is also considered as because kimchi, the amount of water is not that much. And at the end, you get um, the cabbage in solid form. So it's also an example of solid state fermentation product. Yeah? Okay. Tapai. Tapai is also, you know, tapai, kueh tapai. This is kueh tapai. It's also an example of fermented product. Okay, now let's move to fermenter. Eh? Fermenter, bioreactor is the same. Sometimes I call bioreactor, sometimes I call fermenter. So, but it refers to the same thing. That is the platform where the fermentation is carried out, right? So, by definition, is a vessel well where culturing of microbes can be done or cultivation of the microorganisms is conducted. Uh, um, and why we need uh, a special place? Because we want to provide a close atmosphere for the microbes. The reason why we need a close uh, atmosphere for it is because uh, we want to control uh, the, pros, uh, the, um, the cultures from, uh, from the elements outside. We do not want uh, the contaminants to contaminate the culture. That's one thing. And then another thing is why we need it to be close because we need to control the temperature. Let's say in modern uh, platform, we need to control the pH, we need to control the uh, temperature, we need to control the oxygen for aerobic uh, cultures. So that's why it needs to be in a special platform. It needs to be closed system. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, it is specially designed to provide optimal mass transfer in the growth and optimal control and regulation. I talked about the control and re regulation just now. For the mass transfer, uh, if let's say it is liquid uh, state, yeah, let, let's say this one, you can see this is a reactor, and inside here is the liquid culture. Um, uh, during the process, during the fermentation process, uh, you uh, the process, the culture needs to be shaken or need to be agitated. What is meant by agitated means it needs to be stirred. The things inside needs to be stirred so that it's not going to be sediment. Right, so anything if let's say, you know, like drinks, if you prepare drinks, right? After some time, if you don't stir it, it will sediment, right? The uh, the solvent, the solvent, no, the solute, the solute will, the, the Milo will sediment at the bottom. So the same thing goes to the culture. If you don't stir it throughout the fermentation period, uh, all the cells will be sediment at the bottom. So that's why we need to provide an agitation or shaking. So that is meant by a mass transfer. So it means that this uh, reactor, it has the means of agitation inside or the we call it agitator. Yeah, I'll go into that after this. Um, yeah, so the optimal mass, trans uh, mass transfer is important for the for the shaking and also for providing um, aeration. So when we shake it, uh, at the same time, we can also make sure that the oxygen is distributed throughout the culture. Okay, so that's the importance of the mass transfer. So basically, this is the schemat uh, we call it schematic diagram of bioreactor. Okay, so this is the vessel, and this is uh, in the middle here. You can see this is sterile. So when it is in operation, the things will be actually will be agitated inside, will be stirred, yeah, stirred. So this is stirring. And there are so many inlets, uh, for example, the temperature uh, inlet. Uh, so this is to place the temperature prop. Temperature prop is like a device that can, it's like a long device where we insert into the reactor and we can control uh, the temperature. I mean, it, it is connected to the control unit um, where we can read the temperature inside the vessel. And for the pH as well, there is a pH sensor, right? It's a, it's a pH prop inserted inside the vessel. So that's why we need uh, to have the inlets on top of this. Uh, and for the air, there is also an inlet for air where uh, there is a tube actually we connect. Um, there is, a, this is actually a tube, uh, uh, what? A metal tube, and then it is connected to um, to tube inside a tube tube outside, and it is connected to the source of air uh, or the oxygen. Okay, so basically, this is for you to know, and you can see that uh, there is cooling water in, cooling water out. What is the purpose of it? That is a mechanism. Uh, we call it this one is water jacket actually. And it is used for uh, controlling the temperature of the vessel. Okay. So what else? Stirrer. Motor is to uh, agitate the stirrer. So without the motor, the things cannot be agitated. I think that's it. Okay. Nutrients. Uh, this is an inlet for you if let's say you carry out, uh, if let's say you carry out this uh, fat batch and you want to insert the nutrients during the fermentation. So that's why you need this nutrient inlet. Okay. So basically, that's how a bioreactor looks like. Um, okay, so I mentioned just now about the props for the temperature, the props for the uh, pH. Um, so how we 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 could know uh, the conditions inside? It is connected to uh, a control unit. Do I have a picture of it here? Okay, this is what we call vessel or the fermenter, but uh, I don't have the picture. Actually, there is a control unit, a control box, yeah? a control box where all these um, props, there is a wire like that connect uh, all the props to the control unit. And on that screen, like this is uh, an example of the screen uh, of the control unit. From here, we can know what's the temperature inside the vessel, what's the pH inside the vessel. And if let's say the Let's say the pH increase. Uh, so we should 
um, connect it to the acid and base so that um, the temperature can be controlled. So that's the importance of the control unit. Okay, and uh, the advanced reactors nowadays, uh, they are all connected to computer and even you can control from your mobile. You can, uh, the computer is connected to, let's say you, you can connect it to your mobile, mobile phones, and you can check from your mobiles. Uh, let's say you leave the lab, yeah, you leave your cultures. And if you want to know uh, what's the pH now in, of your culture, you can check your mobiles. So there is certain uh, application and software for that. So something, right. So this is just to introduce you that throughout the time, uh, there are so many types of bioreactors or fermenters that have been manufactured by uh, companies, many companies around the world, right? Uh, and at least like 50 years ago, I mean, the uh, invention of bioreactors started, or maybe more than that. So throughout that, yeah, there are so many types of technology introduced, and these are just some of them. Okay? Just to let you know that there is no, uh, it's not only one type of bioreactor. There are many types, many sizes, many models, and that serve many uh, applications or purposes. Yeah. Okay, so the next point is fermentation pathways. Um, so here, when we talk about fermentation, we are concerned with growing the microbes. Uh, we give them food, right? As, for example, carbon source, glucose in the beginning. So what happened to those glucose? We have studied biochemistry, right? We have studied lots of uh, pathway. Like what happened if let's say glucose, you know, metabolism, uh, the word metabolism, anabolism, catabolism. So when you, it, it, let's, say, let's say you imagine yourself, when you eat rice, you eat rice. So what happened in your body? The rice will be metabolized, right? So in science, we say metabolize. It will be degraded. It will be um, degraded into simpler forms. And at the end, you will get the energy from your food. So how you get the energy? Because it has undergo all this pathway. It has been like, for example, glucose, it has it will be converted to this first and then this first on all, all of this we call intermediates, right? Throughout the pathway. The whole thing here, the process of this, the whole the whole um the whole what the whole root here is called pathway okay pathway so there are many pathway depending on the starting material if glucose this is the pathway if you uh, consume something else that is another pathway but at the end it will uh, produce simpler components yeah for example in yourself the easiest for you to imagine you get the energy the ATP at the end uh, so from your from the food that you eat, right? Uh, and the same thing goes for the organisms, microorganisms. When you feed uh, bacteria with, let's say, glucose, what happened? What happened during the fermentation? Because they eat the glucose, so they will metabolize it into these these components until at the end it will produce, let's say, ethanol. Yeah. So that ethanol that we want to get from them. Uh, so, uh, in fermentation, it's very important to understand the pathway. And, uh, of course, it depends on uh, the type of microorganism because different microbes have their own pathway. And also, it depends on the uh, food given to them, right? Uh, glucose or glycerol. So, but in short, to say that you need to know about pathway when we are talking about fermentation. I'm not going to go into any specific pathway, but to in general, uh, understanding the pathway uh, for fermentation is important because that's how you know uh, what will be produced at the end. Yeah. All right. Types of fermentation process. Um, so fermentation is a production process. So there are actually uh, many uh, purposes, uh, many aims of fermentation. When we carry out fermentation, uh, we have certain aims. But of course, just now I mentioned about products. We want to get uh, certain products from uh, the microbes. So uh, getting the products is one of the aim of the fermentation or one type of fermentation. But there are also other types of fermentation whereby we want to grow the microbes 
just to increase the amount of the cell. That is the first type, the yield of cell mass or biomass. Uh, so when we grow the microbes, what happened uh, during the fermentation process, the cells will multiply. You have studied this, all this thing in uh, cell biology, maybe. Yeah, multiply, multiplication of the cells. And then that's how you get at the end, after one hour, you get more cells than it is during uh, uh, in the beginning, right? Um, so uh, the purpose of fermentation, it can be divided into different uh, types. The first one, if let's say you, you just want to get, uh, you just want to increase the amount of biomass or cell mass, yeah, the cells in general, uh, that's, you can do the fermentation. Uh, the second type is when you want to get the products like bioethanol, you want to get the lactic acid, you want to get enzymes or certain metabolites, uh, that is the products. Uh, so that is also another purpose of fermentation. And this, the third type is modification of compounds, means that you want to convert certain things into uh, something else. For example, you want to convert um, agricultural waste, like maybe sago, sago hampas, you know hampas, sago, sago is a starchy crop, uh, you want to convert it into ethanol, so that is, uh, we call it modification of compounds through fermentation process, and the process is also called, apart from, in this case, the, the third uh, type, of, apart from fermentation, we also call it biotransformation, yeah, because the transformation is carried out by the biological organism, we need the microbes to transform, uh, for example, just now the sago hampas into ethanol. Yeah, so that's why it's called biotransformation. Uh, okay, first type, biomass. So what is the example of it? Uh, example of it, if let's say you want to have uh, spirulina algae. Uh, algae. Spirulina is, is an algae. So uh, spirulina is very popular as a supplement, right? So you consume spirulina, actually it, it, is, it, it is actually algae. So uh, to produce more spirulina, you need to do fermentation. So uh, the production of algae, I mean the, yeah, the production of spirulina is an example of the first type, the yield of cell mass or biomass. Um, yeah, so it means that the product is actually the biomass itself, not the product produced by the uh, microbes. Okay, so that's an example of it. Uh, products is very easy for you to relate. Yeah, but just now I mentioned a lot as well, like uh, coffee. You know, coffee is a fermented food. Uh, some of the coffees are fermented. And then chocolate. Chocolate is some chocolates can also be produced from uh, fermentation. Uh, bread. Yeah. Fermented food. There are so many fermented food. Uh, yogurt, cheese, bread, uh, sourdough. Um, Tempe, yeah, and that one is very, very obvious. It's a product, yeah. And then Ajinomoto is also a fermented food. Yeah? It's a biotech product. So anything fermented food is a biotech product because fermentation is, is a field in biotech, right? Uh, but this one is what? Biotransformation is uh, more um, common for uh, something like conversion, like as I mentioned just now, like conversion of waste into something else yeah, is also called biotransformation. Um, agricultural waste, uh, there are so many reports on that uh, if you go through the articles. So just now I mentioned this one. Okay, the production of the products. Um, so this one, uh, when we talk about the products from fermentation, it can be divided into two types. Uh, primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. So what are them? Uh, after this, we're going to cover cell growth, but this is just uh, to introduce. Um, so when we talk about fermentation, we are growing cells. Uh, and we, when we talk about growing cells, you have to know that uh, cell growth, it has, uh, the typical cell growth, it has several phases, right? Several phases like, this is, you have covered this in microbiology or cell biology, leg phase, log phase, second, uh, stationary phase, and finally death phase, right? So that is a typical phase for any cell growth. Um, so 
uh, when we talk about production of products just now, primary metabolites are those products that are produced during uh, the growth phase. The growth is during the log phase over here. So it means that during when you know the cells reach the log phase, the products are also produced during that time. That product is called primary metabolites. Yeah. Uh, and then the second type is secondary metabolites. Uh, those products that are produced during the stationary phase means that after after ni lah, after log phase ni. So during the stationary phase, when the products are produced during that time, that products are called secondary products or secondary metabolites. Okay, uh, examples of it are ethanol, citric acid, acetone, and all this. For the primary metabolite, just now examples are amino acids, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates. So they are uh, set the products, certain products, they are categorized are into either primary or secondary. But it's for you to know that during the growth phase, some products are produced during log phase and some products are produced during stationary phase and they are categorized into these two uh, main groups, yeah? primary and secondary metabolites. Okay, that's the types of fermentation process. Okay, now uh, fermentation modes. Modes means um, format. Format, yeah, format. Okay, so fermentation, it can be divided into three modes. We call it modes. Uh, batch fermentation, fat batch fermentation, and continuous fermentation. So what is the difference between each of these? The most common one, simplest one, is batch. Uh, so batch means, uh, let's say uh, you have the microbes, you have the media, and you have the platform. So now you are ready to start fermentation. And you put the media, let's say you use Shake Plus, but Shake Plus is also possible for you to carry out fermentation. It's not only this bioreactor. Let's say you have the Shake Plus, you, have, you put the, the media into it, and then the microbes, and then you put it in an incubator shaker at 37 degrees, for example. So it means that you are ready to start the fermentation. So you put everything all together and leave it and let the fermentation takes place. So that is batch mode, meaning to say that you put everything and leave it. You put everything all together and you don't do anything uh, except for sampling. Sampling is not part of the fermentation, but what I mean by the process itself, you leave everything, put it uh, and let the fermentation takes place, that is batch mode, okay? So fat batch, uh, fat batch is more common in bioreactor rather than shake glass. So what happened during fat batch, as the name implies, fat, it's, uh, there is a feed, okay? <clears throat> Means that uh, you may start certain amount of media you put into, let's say, bioreactor, you put the microorganisms and you start the operation. You set the temperature, pH, and the fermentation takes place. But after that, let's say after a certain period of time, you may add certain amount of substrate like glucose, normally the carbon source. You, you add certain amount of substrate into it in order to increase the substrate amount in the reactor, right? Uh, so that is called, this format is called fat batch, okay? Fat batch. You insert something, you insert the substrates, during the fermentation. Yes, that's the difference between batch and fat batch. Right, uh, the third type is continuous. So continuous is an extension of fat batch. Okay, now imagine you have, you, you include, you have the things inside running, but you insert the substrate at certain period of time, but also you take out certain amount of products at certain period of time during the fermentation process. Uh, so that, format or mode is called continuous. So it means that continuous, there is something comes in, there is something comes out as well. Yeah, uh, fat batch, there is only something comes in, but you don't take anything out of it, okay, during the fermentation. For batch, there is nothing comes in, there is nothing comes out during the process. You put everything, let the thing start, and just uh, let it start, that's batch, okay. So that's the three differences of these uh, modes of the uh, fermentation. Okay, I think I have explained actually, the feed is introduced once before the process is initiated. Uh, yeah, you can read by yourself, but I have explained. 
the things. So this is the cell growth. When we talk about just now uh, the typical growth phase, um, this is something related to the batch fermentation because you don't alter anything inside. So the, grow, uh, the cells inside the reactor or the vessel, it just grow as the time, uh, as the time goes by. Okay? So you can expect the growth phase will be something like this, yeah? the leg phase, log phase, and then stationary, and finally death phase. But for the fat batch, you can't expect the growth phase to be uh, the same profile as just now. Because the reason, because you have introduced the substrate in, right? Let's say, for example, uh, this is referring to the growth huh? uh, over time. So let's say over time, the growth increase. And then um, what the reason why we insert certain substrate is because the substrate is depleted. It means that this, the, the food inside is finished for the microbes. So we, but still we need the microbes to grow. So that's why we insert the substrate. So when, when it's finished, it drops here. But when you introduce again the substrate, the growth will be enhanced back. So that's why you can see that there is ups and down in the profile in the cell growth for the fat batch because you the the spike is because the spike the spike is because you introduce the food okay and for the continuous fermentation this one will be like this the reason why is static because there is something in something out so uh, that's why uh, the growth will be actually it can be controlled actually at the same uh, rate okay so this is the growth profile of continuous fermentation okay um yeah just to summarize the three modes and their uh growth phase okay uh can we have a break for 10 minutes before we proceed with part two yes doctor, doctor. Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Ah, yes, doctor. Okay. thank you Okay, 10 minutes, okay? And you can get your drinks, maybe.
Okay, guys, uh, let's continue. Um, yeah, so now we are moving to second part, part two. Uh, we are still in fermentation, uh, but we want to talk about cell growth during fermentation, what we should do. Remember fermentation, there are cells growing in it. That's why it's, it's called fermentation process. So uh, that's why we, we need to understand uh, the cell growth. Uh, what are the things that you should do during the fermentation, right? If let's say you are fermenting bacteria, for example, uh, the fermentation process might take about one, 24 hours, one to two days, depends on the types of bacteria. For yeast, it's a little bit longer. Let's say um, three, two, three days like that, a little bit longer than bacteria. Fungi, uh, the longest, maybe one week, two weeks. So during that fermentation period, uh, what I mean just now, the duration is the, the duration of the fermentation, depending on the types of the microbes. So during that fermentation period, uh, we are not just letting the things growing like that. So how we want to know whether the cells are growing or not? Uh, how we want to know whether, uh, you know, sometimes there are contamination or not. So it's best on the analysis of the cell growth during the fermentation. I know that you have studied about cell growth, uh, the basics of cell growth in cell biology and also microbiology, right? So here we want to relate with fermentation process. Okay, so we are going, we are going to look at some basics of cell growth revision uh, for you maybe, and then measurement of the microbial growth. Uh, we have two methods, direct method and indirect methods. And then we're going to have a look at kinetics of cell growth uh, in batch culture and continuous culture. Now let's first have a look at cell growth. Why it is important to study cell growth in fermentation? I've mentioned this now. We need to know whether our cells are growing or not. So we cannot just let the things after one week and then see we check the products directly. So it's not the way that it's supposed to be. Yeah? So during the fermentation, you have to analyze the growth uh, because we want to know whether it's going well or not. So if let's say you are growing fungi, yeah, growing fungi uh, after the three days or maybe four days, you find out that there is no growth and then it's, it's not based on what you expect and you should do something. You cannot just let and let it until like two weeks while well, you not change the culture. So the analysis of the cell growth helps you to determine, to make a decision during the fermentation, whether you want to proceed or not, because uh, during the fermentation, contamination does happen. So if con contamination does happen, your uh, microbes of interest may not grow well. So you may, you may have to do something on it. Yeah. So that's the importance of studying and analyzing the cell growth during a fermentation process. And then we have to know, I mean, in order for us to analyze the cell growth, we have to have understandings in cell growth. We have to know about uh, what are the phases of the uh, cell growth, right? So that's why uh, you have studied before uh, what are the phases, the lag phase, the log phase, uh, the stationary phase, and the death phase. So that you know that, okay, now your cells uh, are in which stage? So you know that if, whether it's going well or not. Uh, and then what's the main difference in the cell growth between different microorganisms? When I say microorganisms, it's a broad term. It covers bacteria, it covers yeast, it covers fungi. The micro, micro means small, right? You cannot see with your naked eye. So you have to observe them under microscope. So that's why they are called microorganism. Macroorganisms are like animal cell cultures, which are much bigger in size. Um, so uh, when you are fermenting different microorganisms, there is a difference in terms of the fermentation profile. So what's the difference? As I said just now, bacteria takes shortest, the shortest time to multiply. So uh, the time for it to reach the death phase will be just about maybe 24 hours or maybe some hours after 24 hours, yeah? but maximum is like 48 hours or maybe less than that. Uh, yeast, because the yeast uh, a little takes a little bit longer than bacteria, it takes a little bit longer time to multiply. That's, that's actually explains why um, the phase, uh, the duration is longer. 
uh, because of the, the size of the yeast cells are much bigger than the bacteria. Bacteria is the smallest among all of the microbes. Uh, so yeast will take about maybe two days or three days to complete the growth phase. Yeah, the growth phase, this one, the growth phase here, the time. So this time is the one that will differ from one microbes to another. For fungi, it will take longer because fungi is much bigger than yeast cells uh, and fungi is much bigger than bacteria, obviously. So it might take um, maybe a few days, maybe five, six days, or even sometimes two, uh, two weeks or three weeks, uh, depending on the types of micro, uh, the fungi. Yeah? Certain fungi grow maybe up to seven days. Certain fungi maybe reach death phase, death phase after two weeks or three weeks. Yeah? So under each type two, bacteria, there are so many types of bacteria, E. coli, bacillus, uh, lactococcus, lactobacillus, yeah? uh, and each of them have different profiles. Can you imagine that? Uh, when we're talking about tip here, this is just typical. Typical means like the average look, how the growth profile should be for every organism. But it differs, it will differ from one bacteria to another bacteria, from, from one uh, microbes to another microbes, yeah? bacteria, yeast, fungi. Even if we're talking about uh the same species there are many strains so it will differ slightly in terms of the time okay uh, so that is um the diversity of microbes that will also affect their growth profile so here we are just talking about typical typical means just uh the basic one uh, the the what it looks like for all uh, so that's why we don't specify uh, the time over here because the time might be different. Right, so when we talk about cell growth, we should know about these phases before we want to analyze our cells during the fermentation, because that will help us to, to know whether it's correct or not. Yeah. Let's say um, you know that when it is stationary, uh, the biomass will be about, about, about similar throughout, let's say for a few hours, because your understanding uh, on the cell growth profile, you know that there is a stationary phase, uh, so you know that your cells are growing, uh, are doing good. So if you do not know about this phase, uh, you might do not know what uh, how your cells are growing. So that's why it's very important to understand uh, the cell growth. Right. Um, okay, so there are so many things that affect the cell growth. Uh, when we conduct the fermentation, maybe the food is not enough for the microbes, so they are not happy, so they uh, they are not uh, growing well. Okay, so it's one of the factors, limited limitation of the nutrients. Nutrients are food, yeah? Uh, I like to say food because it's much easier for you to imagine. When I say nutrient media, it sounds a bit complicated, at least in this uh, beginning. Uh, so when I say food, uh, okay, when the food is, is finished, then the microbes are not happy, so that's why they don't grow. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why the growth might not might be affected. And then the presence of toxic materials. Okay, during the fermentation process, there are so many things produced by the cells. They're not just producing the main product, but also some byproducts, as I mentioned just now. So some byproducts, they could be toxic, toxic to the cells. So what happened uh, when the amount of the toxic materials or the toxic products accumulated inside the culture? Right, it will affect the growth of the cells and, and it will kill most of the cells. So the toxic materials might affect uh, the growth. And other things are the physical environment. Maybe during the fermentation, uh, something's going wrong with the incubator. The temperature is not uh, controlled at 37, for example. Like, for example, E. coli is... Uh, the, the temperature for E. coli is 37, but uh, during the fermentation, the switch might not be working well. Maybe uh, it's not 37 inside the incubator, it's something else, maybe hotter than that, 45 or 50. So something like that, it could affect also the growth. Um, or if let's say the microbes are aerobic, uh, you're supposed to supply the oxygen, but the oxygen is perhaps uh, interrupted right? And there is no oxygen inside the vessel. So that could affect the growth as well. So the cells can't survive without the oxygen. Uh, what else? The pH. 
uh, the pH, something wrong with the control system, maybe, or maybe the production of certain things trigger the spike or uh, the change of the pH during the culture. So it may affect the growth in general, the cell growth. Osmotic stress is something to do with um, the concentration, uh, I mean, the, yeah, the concentration of the culture when there is um, as osmotic, the diff change of the osmotic, uh, yeah, osmotic pressure or change, stress. So that affect the growth as well, okay? So those things can affect the growth. So during the fermentation, actually, you cannot just let the things uh, goes on, you know, you have to stand by uh, in, in, literally you have to like uh, take care of your culture. Uh, I remember when I uh, did my fermentation, yeah, I have to, I just have to stay at the lab. I just have to check whether everything is moving right or not. But of course, you may have to leave it overnight. But to say that you have to take care of your culture, you cannot just let it go for, you know, on it on. Uh, so sometimes uh, anything in the lab, there's so many things happen, uh, power interruption or things that you suppose uh, it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So those things you need to control and monitor during the fermentation. Right. Um, so uh, when we measure the growth, how we want to know the cells are growing or not, we have to measure. So how we measure, there are a few methods that we can uh, adopt, yeah, we can uh, practice. Right. Um, let's take this. So we go directly into measurement. Yeah, measurement. So how I want to know whether my cells are growing well is based on measurement. So what kind of measurement? There are many types of methods and we have to uh, choose it based on the suitability of our fermentation process and also our microorganisms. That's the, that's the most important because we are going to measure the microbes. So the way how we measure bacteria sometimes is different from the way how we measure fungi. Yeah. So we need to know what kind of methods are available. So uh, the methods for the measurement, it can be divided into direct method and indirect method. So there are two categories here, direct and indirect. So let's have a look at direct method first. Why it is called direct method is because um, the, the method is a reflection, is, is a direct reflection. For example, if let's say, um, here, I will go into detail, like dry cell. Dry cell, uh, it reflects the amount of cells directly. Okay, uh, what else? Huh? Let's say go directly. Total cell number, this one refers to the total cell number, the, 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 yeah, the direct total cell number. Mm. Okay, absorbance. Absorbance, why it is absorbance is called a direct method because um, we are measuring the turbidity of the culture. So the turbidity, you know the turbidity, kekeruhan, right? Kekeruhan. So turbidity, so it means that the more turbid the broth or the sample that you are analyzing, it means the more cells are there. Uh, compared to if let's say you have in the beginning media, uh, the media should be clear without microbes. It should be crystal clear without the microbes. But once you put the microbes into it, then it becomes cloudy, cloudy and cloudier and cloudier. So the more cloudier it is, it means that the more uh, microbes are there, actually. The principle is that. So it means that it is directly uh, proportional. Yeah? The turbidity is directly proportional to the amount of the cells. And how we check the turbidity is by the absorbance measurement. So that's why it's a direct method. Okay, let me go first into indirect method so that you have an idea uh, why they are called like that. Indirect method is something that is indirect. Yeah? Uh, for example, uh, the cells are growing and the, the cells produce certain products, let's say uh, proteins, okay? And we measure the proteins uh, based on the assumption that the proteins are produced by the cells. Uh, so now it looks like it's, it's not direct, isn't it? Like we measured protein, based on the assumption that proteins are produced by the cells. So uh, when the protein amount is high, it means that the amount of cells are high because there are more cells, there are a high number of cells that can produce high protein. So that's why it's, it, it is indirect, okay? Uh, measurement of protein, but we want to actually 
measure the cells actually. We want to reflect it to the cells. And also uh, another indirect method is in terms of the substrate consumption. Um, we assume that when there are cells, the substrate, the substrate are the food, the media that we, pro, uh, we provide in the beginning. Let's say we provide in the beginning of the fermentation uh, 20 gram per liter glucose. Okay, so what we expect is that the glucose will be reduced throughout the fermentation period because we know that the cells will consume the glucose. So let's say uh, at zero hour is 20 gram per liter glucose. Let's say after 10 hour, it's maybe 10 gram per liter. So it's reduced from 20. And let's say if let's say we are fermenting uh, bacteria after 24 hours, maybe the glucose is uh, maybe only one gram per liter. So instead of 20 in the beginning, so it means that now it is consumed. I mean, it is reduced and why it is reduced because the cells are the cells eat that uh, glucose. So that's why it's reduced. So uh, we measure the substrate consumption based on that assumption, based on the presence of the cells. So that's why it's indirect. Yeah, and also another way of uh, indirect method is viscosity. Viscosity means like um, viscosity means uh, it it is related to the amount of cells. Uh, when the suspension becomes more viscous, you know viscous. Viscous means uh, likat in Malay. Yeah? Viscous. So when it is more viscous, it means that there are more cells, more cells. Uh, when it is less viscous, let's say in the beginning. Less viscous, it means it has less cells. So the viscosity is an indicator saying that there are cells growing inside it. So when we measure the viscosity, uh, we see the difference in, in the viscosity. We know that the change or the difference is because of the uh, addition or the increase of the cells. Okay, so that is indirect method. Well, I go into indirect method first. Uh, yeah, so it's indirect. So now let's go back to direct method. Direct method is something related directly to the cells. Eh? Uh, dry cell. One of the way how we measure the cells is we take the samples. Okay, how we how we measure the cells. So during the fermentation, let's say uh, fermentation for bacteria, the easiest, 24 hours. So you have to monitor the growth. So how we want to monitor the growth? You have to take the samples. So take the samples, how frequent? Uh, let's say uh, you cannot uh, take it too frequent, otherwise the volume will be reducing the volume of the culture. So you target, let's say you you target to set uh, to take the samples every two hours, normally for bacteria, but this should uh, two hours, every two or three hours, take the samples, check the absorbance, or maybe uh, whatever the method that you are adopting. But the, the first thing that you have to do is you take the samples. What I mean by take the sample is that, let's say you have, the culture in the fermenter or in shake pass, you take it out, let's say the shake pass, take it out from the incubator, take certain amount of the culture, let's say um, five, uh, four milliliter or three, three to five milliliter, take it out. But of course you have to take it uh, in a sterile condition, like under the laminar flow, if you are using uh, shake pass. Uh, if you're using a uh, bioreactor, you have to practice the sterile um, aseptic techniques, like maybe you get ready the flame beside you and then spray with alcohol in order to avoid contamination. Okay? But the basic thing is that you take you take certain amount of culture, put it in tubes, and that samples, we call it samples normally, is what you analyze, yeah? what you analyze. So there are these methods that you can adopt. Uh, dry cell weight measurement, this is, uh, there are two ways centrifugation and membrane separation. So basically like, let's say, uh, let's go for centrifugation first. Huh? Okay, let's say you have just some samples, five mil taken out, and then you pipette, uh, let's say two milliliter of the culture, you put it into tubes, centrifuge tubes, okay? But uh, that centrifuge tubes, uh, you have to weigh it first. You have to weigh it first, uh, get the weight of the empty, uh, tubes, and then when you insert uh, two milliliter of the culture just now, you put it into the tubes. Then you have two milliliter, and then you centrifuge. You know centrifuge, right? You spin it in order to get the pellets to separate the pellets and the supernatin. And once you get the pellet in the tube, you discard 
the supernatant. Supernatant is the liquid portion. And now you have the centrifuge tube with the pellet only, right? And what you, what you do next is to heat it. You put the, I mean, you take the tubes with a pellet, put it in the oven, dry it, uh, dry it, and then um, after, let's say, two days, yeah, after you get constant uh, weight, and after all, I mean, after the pellets has been dried, and then you measure again the pellet and the tubes. So now you get the weight of the pellet and the tube. Got it? Okay. So now in order to get the weight of the dry cell, you subtract the weight of the empty tube that you got in the beginning. So that's why you have to measure the weight of the empty tube in the beginning. Uh, so that's how you got the, um, the weight of the, the weight of the dry cells because now we have dried the pellets, right? Uh, so that is, let's say, at one particular time, let's say at two hours, and then you have to do it for uh, the rest of during the fermentation, like uh, two hour, four hour, six hour, eight hour, until maybe few points until uh, 24 hour. So from there, you analyze the change of the dry cell. It will, if let's say the fermentation uh, goes well, the, uh, the weight of the dry cell will be actually increasing. It, it, will, it will actually follow the pattern of the growth profile. Mula-mula, yeah? uh, leg phase, and then log phase, and then it, uh, stationary, and finally, death phase. It will follow that, that pattern, uh, the dry cell, uh, the change of the dry cell. Okay, So that's how you analyze uh, the growth of the cells. So if it follows that typical growth profile, so uh, it means that uh, the cells grow uh, grow well. Yeah. Membrane is uh, is the same concept that each rumor is just uh, is is based on membrane or uh, filter paper normally. Okay, but the same concept like you are analyzing the dry cells. Okay. Now that one, uh, just this one is suitable for bacteria normally or yeast. Yeah? For fungi, uh, fungi we normally count the cell number. So what is meant by this uh, means that at certain time interval for fungi, uh, the duration of fermentation is longer. Let's say uh, two weeks. So normally for fungal fermentation, we take the samples every 24 hours, not like bacteria just now every two hours. So let's say for fungal uh, fungal fermentation, we take the samples every 24 hours. Uh, and what we do with the samples, instead of putting it in the centrifuge tube like the other method, we count the cell number. So it means that uh, take certain amount of the sample and then dilute it appropriately. This one is you have to uh, pass on trial and error. And then uh, we use this what we call hemocytometer slides. It looks like if you know the microscope slide, uh, when you put the specimen under a microscope, you have to put it under a slide, right? But that slide, it doesn't have the grid. This is grid, we call it, uh, the small squares. What are the slides that you, you were using during your micro practical last time? It was just an empty slide. You just put the things on it and then you put it under the microscope and you view it, right? So this one, it has grids. It has grids. So what is the purpose of this grid? You can see actually um, they are small squares like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's actually five times five. You can see that this is, um, even though there are some small grids inside, uh, there is a, a bigger grid, a, a bigger, what, a bigger square. You can see one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So the purpose of those grids is actually for you to monitor or for you to count uh, the cell number. So these are actually this, how the cell number will look like. It will, it will look like a dot under the microscope. So that's the thing that you have to count, actually. It's very tedious. Uh, I, I, I applied this when I did uh, fungal fermentation during my MSc studies. So what we have to do is like we have to count every, that's why they make it like a bigger square like this, so that it's much easier. Like, you count the first square, how many how many dots are there, followed by the rest. 
Uh, so we have to like, you know, like uh, count carefully under the microscope. So what you will see actually under the microscope is the dots. It's like small dots. So that's the cell number. Uh, and of course, there is a, actually there is a formula la, that you have to apply based on the numbers that you have. You have to use the formula and that is uh, the amount of uh, cells per milliliter of sample, something like that. Okay. But just to introduce you, the method is about counting the cell number under the microscope. And this is uh, suitable for fungi. Fungi, yeah? Okay, viable cell number. So this one is you take the samples and you grow it on a media, on an agar media, and see how many cells, viable cells arise. Uh, so this is a direct method, yeah? Why is there a method? It's, it's, you can see directly whether the cells are growing or not. Yeah, I just go a uh, brief here. You can read by yourself. Absorbance, I mentioned just now, is about measuring the turbidity. Why we are measuring the turbidity? Because it's based on the Beers Lambert law. You, have you, I'm sure you have learned it in your biochemistry. So it means that the absorbance will increase if, let's say, the amount of the things inside is increased as well. So that's that reflects uh, actually the cells, yeah. So the more to beat the growth or the samples, it means that the more cells are there. Uh, so the higher the absorbance means uh, the higher the amount of the cells inside it. Uh, pack cell volume. This one is centrifuge, and then you have to measure the the height of the pack cells. This is not really a common method. I never use this. But basically, you want to analyze the change of the pellets of the time. So it means that, yeah, it's based on the scale on the tubes. Okay. Right. So that's direct method. Indirect method we have covered just now. For the kinetics, um, I, don't, I don't want to really focus on the kinetics, but it's just to show you that uh, what we, when we have the profile like this, we know that. Uh, the lag phase, the log phase, the stationary, and the death phase. Uh, this is actually when we say when when we have this profile, this is actually the kinetics profile. Why it is kinetics? Because it is over time. Anything that is over time that is called kinetics. We measure something based on the time. Okay. Uh, so nothing much that I would like to highlight here. Uh, yeah, you know already what are these phases, and then. Um, yeah, this is just to show uh, the factors that could affect the growth rate. Uh, it could be affected by the substrate concentration. Okay, for example, if we provide the microbes with glucose, yeah, uh, at certain point, if let's say you increase the concentration of the substrate, it may increase the concentration of the cells or the, the amount of the cells. But at certain point, uh, it might not any longer uh, introduce the change. What I mean is that if let's say you you pro you provide 10 gram per liter glucose, 20 gram, 30 gram, 40 gram. So obviously 40 gram, let's say lah, let's say uh, the cell will be much higher than uh, the culture that only has 10 gram per liter. But let's say at 50 gram per liter, there is no more uh, increase of the cells. You suddenly see that although you provide 50 gram per liter, but the growth of the cells is much lo uh, much lower than that in 40 gram per liter. So actually, it has reached the maximum, the maximum level lah, eh? the maximum level. Like for example, like us lah, if let's say we eat certain amount of rice, one spoon of rice, we are still happy, fine. Two spoons of rice, okay. Three spoons. But if let's say you are up to like two plates of rice, you are full enough. You are no longer capable to eat the food, right? So you do not want the rice anymore. So you cannot actually, uh, that is actually the maximum level. Uh, so for the microbes also, it has, every microbe it has its own maximum level of, I can say the, the substrate. Yeah, uh, so how to know that is based on research, okay? And for the temperature, uh, this one is uh, every temperature has every sorry every microbe has its own favorite temperature. Yeah? So uh, the microbes are divided into uh, different um, groups: thermophiles, those that can resist 
more than uh, 40 degrees. Mesopause is between 20 to 50. This is meso M. T is psychopause is between that, uh, 0 to 30 degrees. Right? And that's the category of the microbes based on the temperature. Okay, pH pun uh, sama, like some of the microbes are happy at certain pH, some are happy at certain pH. But sometimes, uh, some microbes, they can survive at pH, let's say 5, between 5 and 7, or maybe 5 to 8, let's say that. But at pH 5, they will produce something else uh, as a main product. At pH, maybe at pH 7, they will produce something else as the main product. So the metabolism um, will be changed based on the pH. So that's why it's very important to control the pH during the fermentation. Okay, for the continuous culture, this uh, might not be that really important for uh, for, for you to know. Uh, so there actually is about, um, in the continuous culture, we talk about uh, Putting in the putting the substrate in and taking the, the products out right during the fermentation. So uh, the key point here is that uh, the growth rate, the growth rate, it can be controlled by the rate of supply of the substrate. That's the thing that you have to know in this. Um, yeah. So the product it depends on also the feeding. Uh, so because it's something to do with the kinetics of the culture. So I might not say it's really critical for you, but it's just, yeah, it's just enough for you to say, to know about um, Nila, that's the difference, the growth rate, how the growth rate can be influenced in the continuous culture. Okay. So normally in the industrial scale, people use continuous culture over batch culture because it's much easier to control the things. Uh, this one you can read by yourself. I think that's it. Uh, yeah, we, I'm, I'm sure that you have uh, you must be exhausted already. Two hours of lecture. Yes, that's the end of uh, today's lecture. Uh, basically, we have covered uh, the first thing, why we study bioprocess technology. Yeah, that's very important because that's the key thing about this course, why you are here. Yeah? Uh, you cannot neglect the importance of bioprocess in biotechno uh, biotechnology. And then we move to the first LU, uh, the Fermentation. Fermentation is a production stage, is a production process. Uh, uh, yeah, in biotech, we are talking about fermentation as a means of producing bioproducts. So you have to know what is it, what uh, the background of fermentation, the tools, the platform, uh, some of the importance, you know, like pathway, the types, the modes, how you measure the cell growth during the fermentation and also the kinetics at the end. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Any question? Oh, the QR code shows error. You cannot scan it? Yes, doctor. Oh, really? Um, hold on, let me share. Well, I post on Elip later, okay? So you can fill in the Google form on Elip so that it doesn't take your time. All right, so that's all for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, that's all then.